And it's, it's easy to get these things going if you're starting on the green field. When I started my own company three years ago, it was easy to grow my own business culture to start with automation from the first server to get measuring in place and obviously uh, as I'm curating the DevOps track, I'm trying to share knowledge as well. But what do you do if you have an existing company? Maybe that's been existing for decades that has a very much matured culture. How do you get DevOps going in such a, comp in, in such a business? Well, I'm very happy that we'll have John Topper here to tell us about that, tell us about his experience, good or bad, we'll see. And I'm very much looking forward to hear what uh, he has to tell us. Thank you, John. Right. Steady on, I haven't started yet. <laughs> Thanks, Jochen. Um, yeah, I mean, as, as Jochen says, I, I'm John Topper. I run a small um, DevOps consultancy out of London. Uh, we work with uh, small clients and large clients, so we have a uh, luckily a, a broad view of all of the uh, the spectrum of, of organisations. But this this is um, talk largely about our experiences in one particular uh, large organisation a, a, a couple of years ago now, um, and uh, we'll be talking about uh, what we learned um, in that organisation um, as we attempted to put in uh, DevOps processes and specifically around Drupal. So uh, when we talk about DevOps, uh, I'm assuming that since you're here on the DevOps track, you have some kind of concept of what we actually mean by that. Um, if not, um, the way I kind of look at DevOps really is that it's, it's mostly about uh, shared ownership of the quality and the availability of code and platform uh, in combination. Uh, this is the, the graphic from, uh, from Wikipedia. Um, it's a bit hokey, but it basically shows you that the, these three areas need to work together uh, to uh, to share the, uh, the quality and availability of, of, of what's being built. Um, DevOps is really a, um, it's a fairly recent term. It's quite a, um, it's quite a recent coinage. Uh, really, it's, it's been sort of uh, rising in popularity since about 2010, as you can see from this graph from Google Trends. And really, it's, I look at it as uh, another name for, for good practice sysadmin, um, and that's sort of what recruiters have started to use it as, um, which I'm kind of okay with, because I don't think we really need a new term for it anyway, but uh, I guess having a, a name that we can kind of uh, put events together with is quite an important thing. Uh, it's a bit tribal, I guess. Um, it's not quite the, um, uh, the cultish uh, thing that some people might might view it as if they've uh, if they've been reading a lot of blogs or uh, or only been exposed to it incidentally, um, and as as Jochen says, we we have these these four pillars that we refer to. These were coined by John Willis, uh, who you might know on on various internet places as Botcha Galoop. Um, he was formerly of Opscode um, and is I think currently still at Enstratus, who have recently been acquired by Dell, um, and he shares uh, shares these four things with us and. Uh, Culture is, is really the shared values and, and vision and knowledge within an organization uh, without which we can really do any good. Uh, automation is all about removing manual steps, reducing the margin for error, um, getting, uh, getting more things scripted, uh, basically to improve the quality and the, and the efficiency of what we're doing. There's monitoring, uh, so improving the operational visibility of the platform, understanding um, what it's doing, why it's doing the things that it's doing, um, what's different now when it's gone wrong versus what it was doing previously. And sharing, which is kind of, um, as, as sysadmins, we've, we've traditionally been a little bit kind of stuck in the basement of building, not talking to anybody. Um, and uh, the, the sharing aspect really is about making sure that these, these monitoring data are, are available to, um, to everybody, um, sharing tools, sharing processes, sharing approaches, uh, blogging about it, talking about it, getting everybody involved in the conversation. It's all very important stuff. And if you've been reading about DevOps um, online or, uh, or maybe you've, you've watched some of the videos that have come out of previous DevOps days, um, then you'll have heard of, of a lot of these kind of organizations that we sort of lift up as, as being examples of people who are doing DevOps particularly well. And uh, these are people like Instagram, who at the time of their acquisition by Facebook had just 13 employees. 
um, which considering the amount of cash that Facebook paid for them, I don't remember exactly how much it was, but that was a lot of money, uh, is pretty impressive. It's a very efficient organization. Uh, people like Spotify, who are very often at, uh, at puppet events, sharing what they do in, in their world, how they, how they use their configuration management tooling. People like Etsy, who, uh, who've done a, an amazing job at sharing a lot of the tooling that, they, that they've created. Uh, and IMVU, GitHub, um, people that are, are talking about what they're doing and, and people that we, we look at as, as good examples of, of, of the craft, if you like. IMVU um, was uh, was Eric Reese's um, lean startup, I guess, um, and he was blogging about releasing code once every ten minutes, tested, working, and and into live, um, probably sort of four or five years ago, which is really the sort of inception of all this stuff, anyway. But one thing that we notice when we when we kind of look at these organisations is that they were all founded or, or kind of um, launched within the last decade. They're quite young. They're they're small companies, and they're all. Um, they're all ostensibly technology companies. That's what they're selling. The, 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 the technology is, is an end in itself for these sorts of organizations. And uh, really, that kind of makes them a bit like this guy. Oh, excuse me. Um, he's uh, kind of noisy and young. Uh, and not all companies are like this. This is not a, not a sort of um, a truism within DevOps that, that everybody is, is a small, agile, technology-focused company. And probably, and I don't know what the statistics are, but the it could probably be shown that, that most companies are not like this. But we hear from the, from the noisy ones. And really, um, some companies are a bit more like these guys. They're, they're old, they're slow, they're a bit angry about everything, but they're quite well known. They've been sat in that box for a long time. They're doing quite well at it. Um, and these are the sorts of organizations that, that, um, that I'm talking about when we talk about large organizations. Uh, and so we'll, we'll look at one particular large organization that my consultancy uh, spent some time working with uh, a couple of years back. But before we do that, I'm going to ask you a seemingly unusual question. Um, those of you from the UK, how, how many people from the UK have we got in the room? Okay, this will make some amount of sense. So the uh, connection between um, a, a large stately home full of posh English people and, uh, and a Z-list celebrity in the Australian jungle eating a kangaroo anus to win treats for the rest of his group. These are both television programs, right? They're both television programs put on the air by the same company. There's Downton Abbey on, the, uh, on the, the left-hand side there, and I'm a celebrity, get me out of here, on the right. And the thing that connects these two uh, organizations, or these two programs, aside from the fact that they're both published by the same uh, organization, is that they both, in the past, at one point, had Drupal uh, web properties associated with them. And the company we're talking about, for those of you who are, who are not from the UK, is a company called ITV. And ITV is the, the UK's largest television network, uh, commercial television network, I should say. Um, it was launched in 1955, so this is a 60-year-old company, right? This is your, your Statler and Waldorf of organizations. They're, they've been around a long time. Uh, there are f over 4,000 employees, uh, or at least that was true at the end of uh, 2012, which is where I got these figures from. Um, and, uh, and they have sizable revenues. And, and the thing to, things to bear in mind about this organization is that they are, um, they're old and large, um, but they're also not primarily a technology company. The technology exists as a way of putting uh, entertainment, if you want to call it that, uh, in the case of kangaroo anus eating in the jungle, uh, in front of uh, the general public. And some of that technology is, is broadcast. Some of it is putting things on cable television networks. Some of it is on the internet. And the internet uh, stuff is, is on the rise. Um, and that's where we sort of come into this story, really. Most of this revenue comes from advertising, right? So this is, this is uh, interstitial ads in between programs uh, that you sit through in order to get to the content that you want to watch. Uh, and the first advert that, uh, that ITV put on its air was for a, a toothpaste uh, back in 1955 called Gibbs SR, um, a long forgotten brand these days, no doubt, um, but which presumably is, uh, is the sort of thing you're going to be wanting to buy if you've spent a week in the jungle. Uh, so 2010, quarter four, is when we, we sort of picked this story up. And um, when we started at, uh, at ITV in, in 2010, the majority of the web content was served from a .NET content management system, a big sort of uh, internally grown, um, organically grown uh, homebrew CMS platform. There were some Drupal 6 sites in existence. These were quite small, um, primarily built by external agencies, arguably not very well um, 
quite difficult to maintain, to upgrade, lots of sort of hacking gone on in the core where it shouldn't really have been. Um, the .NET platform um, was being released on a kind of six weekly cycle. Um, and uh, these releases would take place out of hours um, with a bunch of developers and some pizza and some cola. Um, and it would take a number of hours to, to, to happen. Uh, and no one would go home until it's finished or until it's rolled back. Um, and, and this isn't a, a comfortable place for anyone to be, really. In order to, uh, to deal with, with this sort of um, big, complicated uh, release process, there was a, a big, complicated change management process where uh, a man with a clipboard would require uh, developers to write a lot of Word documents about how this was going to happen, uh, the intent being that this would improve the quality of the release. Um, Arguably it did, um, but not to the extent that was necessary really. A lot of these releases, probably one in three I think, uh, were being rolled back at, at this point in time um, to make way for another attempt on another evening with another load of developers and beer and pizza. The organization itself had a, a, um, a multi-tier operations team, so a sort of first line, second line, third line style operation. Uh, and the first line team really would, were uh, performing manual tasks um, that the content management system should have been capable of doing. So a lot of the, the frontline team's tickets were about adding rewrite rules to, uh, to uh, traffic managers uh, so that the new TV show could have a vanity URL. And that, and that sort of thing, really, as, as people who use Drupal, we kind of look at that and go, that's not really very smart. Uh, but there were, there were people employed to do that sort of task on a day-to-day on -day basis. The availability and performance of these sites were pretty bad. Um, the, the fact that Akamai was sat in front of these web properties probably saved an awful lot of grief, uh, but it hid an awful lot from everybody. Um, there was only kind of minimal monitoring of this stuff. Uh, some enterprise monitoring platforms um, were being paid for. Uh, these had been tuned to ignore the first half an hour of alerts because that might be normal. Um, just kind of n not, not good practice for the most part. Um, and the, the ops team probably, I think, was around 12 to 14 people, and there was a budget on the table for increasing that to, to, uh, to increase the, the operational hours of the platform. Um, in spite of that, though, I mean, the, the ops team were only responsible for the application. The, the, the software, sorry, the, the hardware, the hypervisor, the switches, network, SANS, all of that kind of hardware, all operated by third parties under a service management contract. And so there were people in that ops team whose main job it was, was to triage tickets between uh, end users within the business and this third party team. Really inefficient use of people, basically. Um, and the, the primary cause for things like the, the poor availability and performance was just some bad architectural mistakes. And uh, architectural mistakes that had, had come about through miscommunication, uh, there'd been an assumption that um, the developers weren't ever allowed to use a database anywhere near the front end. And so they would built a database out of XML and, and shared file systems. And it was just a, uh, crazy. Um, and, you know, we're tempted to laugh at this, right? This is, this is a, a, a comedy situation. It's a comedy of errors. Every, everyone's kind of uh, in this position at some point in their lives as a technology company of a certain size. But really, it's important to realize that, that nobody tries to get here. Nobody aims to be this bad at stuff. Um, and there's a context. So there, there is reasons why um, we're bad at these things. And the context... Um, in part, as I see it, and this is, this is largely uh, my opinion rather than anything that, that um, I would argue to have measured, um, but a lot of the problems were down to um, the, the web deliverables were tied to TV broadcast dates. So you'd be building a piece of technology, someone would go, oh, I need that for this program, and then all of a sudden you've got a deadline that you previously didn't have. Um, these broadcast dates don't change. If the website doesn't work, no one's taking Downton Abbey off the air. Um, which is a, a, a kind of grim realization for those of us who have done work with startups where actually if things aren't ready and are likely to fall on their ass, you probably won't release them. But also, it, even though we're working on, on fairly tight timescales, um, tight immutable timescales, there's a lot of last minute changes come in. I mean, it's a creative organization. Um, a, a, media company to me feels an awful lot like an enormous agency and the agency model is very much like get this out of the way get the next client through the door um, and so there's no real kind of uh, focus on on reusability or quality or those sorts of things uh, this was a, a, a uh, an online operations team living within a 4,000 person organization 
There are many other teams within that organisation that could place demands on that operations team, none of which necessarily went through um, any kind of uh, management hierarchy of commonality. They'd just appear one day, uh, you come in in the morning and there'd be a new thing that had to be live by Saturday. And, and these are the sorts of things that, um, that just sort of show up and, and distract from time to time. Uh, in particular, uh, one, uh, one piece of, of fairly small programming on one of the, the channels um, that very few people actually watch um, the creatives had decided they wanted to put an opera singer in a studio, point a camera at them, have them sing tweets, and live stream this on the internet on Saturday. You know, this was this was midweek, um, and we did our best to accommodate these sorts of things. Um, it's also important to see that in in 2010, uh, we we're sort of recovering from the financial crisis to some extent. I guess we still are to some extent. Um, and so a lot of people have been laid off. There were a lot of uh, a lot of tribal knowledge had exited the building. Um, lots of people licking their wounds. Arguably, some of the better people had left. Um, a lot of the, the the things that that the dev team knew about the uh, or the, the amount of code that, that an individual member of the dev team had seen um, was probably probably lower by percentage than uh, than it had been previously. Um, and there are third parties who are doing some of this service delivery. So, you, as an organisation, um, this team didn't have complete control over over the end to end delivery of all this stuff. We also had some in-flight projects on the go at this point in time. Um, an in-flight project such as a multi-million pound data center refresh. Uh, the, after the layoffs, there were a number of buildings that had um, fewer staff in. Uh, as, a, uh, as a sensible precautionary measure, uh, we were looking to move IT infrastructure out of office buildings and into data centers so that the office buildings became less of a, of a place of reliance. Uh, we'd recently had a, a completely new uh, new board installed, new CEO, uh, chairman, I guess. Um, and so there was a business transformation project on the go. And the business transformation project was designed to to get out of this or avoid in future the situation that had led to these redundancies in the first place, which is if you're a company whose sole income comes from advertising, um, then when the bottom drops out of the financial market, advertising revenue dries up, everything's fucked essentially. So part of the business transformation program was to find a way of, of generating revenue from, uh, from sources other than advertising, basically. So selling directly to the consumer, um, expanding into international markets, uh, all of those sorts of things, which is why things like Downton Abbey are all over the world right now. As well as this, we, we're looking at a completely new head team in the online on demand part of the business. Uh, and so there's a there are new projects spun up to to replace the content management system, which isn't agile enough for anybody, um, and uh, a new online video player project just for good measure, um, in order to to allow us to sell uh, video content to the general public and, and hopefully avoid these uh, these financial uh, problems in the future. And that's where Drupal comes into the equation. Both the uh, the online video player project and the CMS project um, began in life as as Drupal projects after a um, after a, a process of um, RFP where we went out to tender and, and looked at a number of different options. Some of them .NET options to address the fact that most of the internal knowledge was was in .NET, um, but there were a couple of Drupal contenders, um, and uh, and eventually we we chose Drupal as a um, as a platform. So in order to, to build a Drupal platform, obviously we needed a new Linux platform. Uh, up until this point, the, the Linux serving out of this organization was a couple of Drupal 6 sites um, with uh, single points of failure all over the place, manually configured um, VMs running Red Hat 4 with, uh, with old versions of, of PHP and MySQL on. Um, kind of a mess, really, uh, but reasonably contained. And the benefit of only having uh, one server per property is that if you don't have any many properties, you don't have too many servers to worry about. Um, and so we, my team um, and people that we brought in as new hires for the business um, started to, to build out a new Linux platform for this stuff. And we'll talk briefly about the, the technological um, or the technology pieces that we used as, as part of this uh, deployment. Uh, so we were automating configuration using Puppet. Uh, we were building uh, development environments using Vagrant. Uh, we built continuous deployment pipeline using Jenkins, and uh, and we'd gone through a hiring process. And the, the hiring process was um, was a bit more than just interview. Now we went through technical tests and, and found a, a good team of people. I apologise to Paul who sat in the middle because uh, one of the guys we hired used to work for him. Um, 
and uh, and so we 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 built these the, these technology components. Twelve months of replacing the DevOps market is difficult. If you are not currently working in DevOps, consider it as a career option. <laughs> we'll leave that to the end. <laughs> Uh, so we use Puppet for, for doing our, our configuration management. And um, if you're unfamiliar with, with these tools, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of briefly cover them. If you want to know a bit more detail, then come and talk to me afterwards, and I'll, I'll sort of uh, do my best to, to explain them. Um, Puppet's a, uh, a configuration management tool. Um, it's, uh, it's one of a number of, of current tools in, in that space. You've also got things like Ops Code Chef, uh, Ansible, SaltStack, all of those kind of things. Uh, the question is often asked, should I use Puppet or Chef? The answer to that question is yes. Uh, it doesn't really matter what you use, um, but this is an important thing to look at. Configuration management is an area that if you're not doing it, you are probably going to be in trouble, uh, particularly if you're running a, more than a handful of servers. Uh, and it allows us to build infrastructure as code. It allows us to, to sit down with a text editor and describe to, uh, t into a text file in a domain-specific language how we would like our servers to look. Uh, it's convergent, which means that having built my description of how a server should look, uh, if I run it on a server, um, the tool will take a look at the current state of the server, take a look at the, the required state or the desired state that I've described, and work out how to get from one place to the other. And it will only make as many changes as it needs to bring that configuration in line with how I've described it. So the second time I run Puppet on a, on a using correctly written Puppet manifests, um, nothing will change because the server is already in the desired state that we've described. And it runs client server uh, or masterless, which means that it's, it's suitable of, uh, for kind of running thousands of nodes or just one or two. It really doesn't matter kind of what, what approach you take. It's, it's able to do both of those things. Um, and infrastructure as code means that uh, we have access to, uh, to software tools for writing this kind of stuff. So you can use your, your IDEs, your Emacs or Vi or you know, Eclipse or whatever other perversity you like. Um, and you can use uh, version control systems. Um, you can use continuous deployment, uh, continuous integration tooling to, to test these things. Um, and that puts you in a powerful position because that, that means that you can start looking at uh, infrastructure as code components. And if you are building a DevOps team with, uh, with developers and operations staff, a lot of this stuff is kind of familiar to developers. It's not necessarily a, a very straightforward language to pick up. Um, but given time, it's, it is easy to follow, and, and it's fairly easy, given a, an existing structure, uh, to figure out what changes you need to make to, to get the effect that you personally desire in the change. You use pull requests, as, in, uh, as you would if you're collaborating on a Git project to, to uh, quality control that stuff. Um, it all becomes much more like developing code, and that's, that, I think, is quite a, quite a powerful thing. Another powerful uh, tool um, that we use as part of this project, this was actually the first time we'd used this particular tool. Um, it's now a, an absolute staple of pretty much everything that we do. Uh, it's a tool called Vagrant. Um, some of you, if you've been following the DevOps scene, may have, may have heard of Vagrant, maybe using it yourselves. Uh, you may have heard Mitchell um, talk about it at uh, one of the, uh, the events, one of the many events all over the world that he speaks at, at about it. Um, Vagrant is it's essentially a tool for managing development environments. And um, it's a, a set of Ruby um, command line operations around managing virtual machines, either locally or, or on remote hypervisors or on AWS or whatever. It's all sort of plugin based. Um, on, the get, on, the, on the host operating system, it supports Linux, Mac, and Windows. So it doesn't matter what your developers are using. Well, OK they're probably not going to get much joy if they're using FreeBSD, to be fair. But they, if they're using Linux, Mac, or Windows on their desktop, um, then they're all going to be capable of running this thing. And it allows, uh, allows me as a, uh, as a DevOps person um, to provide a, um, a base image and some Puppet or other configuration management uh, language for standing up a new development environment that is as close to live as we can make it because it uses the same puppet manifest, it uses the same operating system packages, it uses the same version of the operating system as a starting point. Uh, and this is, again, really powerful. It means that in a, in a development team of, of, say, 20 people, if we contrive to upgrade the PHP version uh, by a point release, you don't then have 20 people building PHP for a morning and trying to figure out linking arguments and all the other joyous things that go along with trying to build PHP. We can just build a new package, ship it into the package repository that we're using with Vagrant, uh, and ask that they update their Vagrant environment, and, and there we have it. Um, 
it uses a folder sharing mechanism to expose folders from your uh, from your local machine inside the virtual environment and the development environment, which means that, again, you can stick with Emacs or Eclipse or TextMate or, or whatever it is you're using as your development environment, uh, your tools of choice, um, and know that when you come to run the code, it's going to run inside a virtual machine using all the same packages, all the same versions of everything as is going to be available on live. Because we're using version... Uh, version puppet manifests we can stage these things we can provide pre-release versions that we then move through environments into staging and then live um, this is a really good way of, of providing these dev environments it means you, your developers need a fast laptop with decent ssd in it with a decent amount of ram but if you're not buying them those sorts of things already you hate your developers and please don't do that the environments then become as portable as a laptop. So rather than having a development environment that is a virtual machine on a hypervisor sat in a cupboard somewhere, which is a fairly standard pattern for, uh, for development organizations, you can now stick it on your laptop, take it home. So uh, if you do hate your developers and you're going to make them work on the weekends, they can at least do it on their own laptop instead of coming into the office. So after Vagrant, we, we, uh, we looked at Jenkins. Um, Jenkins is a... Um, it's a a continuous deployment tool it's essentially providing orchestration around build test deployment um, and really it's just a it's a batch job runner with a nice interface it's not a complicated tool necessarily but you can do some pretty complex things with it it's like lego you, you can build some quite impressive stuff with jenkins um, and importantly for a large organization um, you can have a dashboard that everybody can see uh, you can construct different shaped dashboards for different business units so the change and release manager can see what is available um, it has role-based access control so you can authenticate this against your active directory or, or other horrifying identity service uh, and use that to to permit only people with the change and release management group membership to release code uh, and in a, an organization like ITV it's kind of important that you don't push out a new version of the home page in the middle of a really big show um, and so the change and release manager is the guy who sort of owns that process and that was, was an important thing to put in there's a load of plugins for this you can use Jenkins to spin out uh, you can use it with Vagrant in fact to spin out new test environments um, it has plugins for all the standard uh, version control tools um, it, it's got all sorts of stuff we also put in Zabbix for monitoring. Um, those of you who are um, passionate about monitoring, not looking at anywhere in particular, Chris in the back there, um, don't really like Zabbix because it's old and a bit crap. Um, that's true. I'm not going to disagree with that, but it, the thing that Zabbix gives you is it, it's a, a single software tool that does both time series trend uh, gathering and also anomaly alerting. Um, and it's quite easy to get up and running, even if it's a bit point and click. Um, and it's certainly way better than no monitoring. Uh, and uh, in our view, certainly in, in 2011, it was much better than sitting down with, with Graphite and trying to plug all those pieces together. It gave us a quick win on, on exposing this data. Also meant that we could monitor the Windows platform uh, because you can run SNMP traps and, and that sort of thing. Um, but this gave us uh, insight into what the servers were actually doing, which is which was new and, and exciting data for, for a team that had never really looked under the hood in that way. So the scope of these projects, um, it started out initially as two Drupal sites. There was uh, a, a, a site refresh for a, for a specific site that had been built in Drupal 6, I believe, uh, by an agency. This was being improved, have, uh, was having a better search added to it. Um, and... Um, on top of that, it was there was intended to be a generic CMS build, and this was the this was the intention. Intention was to replace the .NET platform with whatever this resulted in. Um, but the pipeline and the and the team that was doing all this work kind of um, the responsibilities grew uh, into all the other Linux properties. So. Um, as as a uh, as a completely non-random, utterly real example, um, the opera star singing in a studio live stream thing um, that all had some PHP back end and some flash front end that needed to be deployed that went through the, the deployment pipeline so any anything new that popped up the, the mantra was it goes out into the platform via the pipeline or it doesn't happen at all uh, and we'd uh, we'd made attempts to to provide the vagrant dev environments to the third parties uh, largely outsourced um, to, to be able to, to develop their software within on the understanding that if it works in the vagrant environment it'll probably work in production as well I say intent, didn't quite work like that. Um, then, uh, as other larger projects cropped up, so for example, the new player platform, um, 
it was generally understood across the business that new sites were being built in Drupal. And so new teams started cropping up with uh, oh let's build this in Drupal so they come and talk to to the teams that were already working with Drupal and they go away with a new set of tools to to try and use um, this developed into into a number of off-site and on-site teams uh, and by the end I would say there are probably 50 or, or possibly more developers all working on projects that related to Drupal um, with this tool chain um, Possibly more than that, uh, and I include sort of uh, JavaScript themers, uh, JavaScript developers, CSS people, um, product managers, project managers, all of those kind of members of staff. These are, this is a lot of people, like a massive project, and it grew to the, the size that it was probably in about three months, three to four months, something along those lines. I may, may be mis misremembering. Uh, but the teams, crucially, were owned by different business units, and a lot of the business units had no commonality in management structure until you got to board level. Uh, and that was part of the business transformation was to try and solve some of these problems, but it essentially meant that you had different people, different agendas, doing different things with the same tooling, uh, all reliant on one team and, and their, um, their kind of, I guess, gatekeeping of the, of the live platform. Um, some of these external teams from different countries, uh, different time zones, different languages. Um, it all got kind of complicated. So, what did we? How did we win? Like, what, what did we do that worked pretty well? Um, we'll cover that first because there's more of the rest. Um, we the wins that we had. We had automated deployment of the of the Linux platform from day one, and this was this was kind of um, it was a mantra. Um, we enforced it. Uh, I was in charge of the team that was doing all of these kind of build work. They knew that they were not to be doing anything that wasn't automated. Um, and the automate everything mindset came partly as a result of, of our presence in the organization, but also partly because those are the types of people that we hired. Um, and I think it's probably fair to say, have we got any Windows people in the room? No? Okay. I, I think it's fair to say that Linux people are better at automating things, or at least the, the tool chains that existed on, on Windows for automating stuff up until recently have been absolutely shocking. Um, now with things like um, PowerShell, and actually they're, they're a puppet and chef for Windows now, um, that is a, a situation which is gradually improving, um, but it was definitely the case that the team as existed in that organization was not really au fait with the idea of automating that much. There was some stuff with group policy objects in Active Directory and, and those sorts of things, but no real kind of let's make all the IIS servers do this same thing at once. There's configuration drift everywhere. Um, New team members always bring outside experience, and I think it, it sort of, after a period of layoffs, adding new new members of, of staff with new ways of thinking, I think it was quite invigorating for for a team, uh, and a lot of the existing guys who who hadn't really kind of uh, been that involved with uh, with getting their hands on automation and stuff were quite excited about it. And the the um, the support teams, uh, the operations teams. Uh, they were given new Linux-related responsibilities, and so they were learning new things. And people always thrive when they're learning new things. Um, we removed a lot of complexity from the change management because we were automating stuff. Um, you didn't need to write a seven-page uh, Word document on what you were changing, why, and how. You were pressing a button in Jenkins, and it was running this script that you tested. Um, and so a lot of that complexity went away, um, as did the change and release manager who didn't really understand why it was not important to write all these documents. That was a win. Um, we increased the operational visibility. So we had monitoring. Uh, we also, which I didn't mention, added um, at this point gray logs so that you could, uh, as a developer, go and see the logs that were coming out of the Drupal platform. Um, everybody had a better idea of what things were doing. We put pinged them in to look at the outside world. Uh, we put some better monitoring on Akamai. The, the whole thing got a bit more visible. What challenges did we have? Well, we were building these environments and the and the and I say the project, the projects plural simultaneously, and so any problem with the environment um, would play into uh, the developer timeline. And most of the development was being performed by external parties who'd already agreed to deadlines, um, and so an internal team causing a blockage for an external team who had had a deadline put on them um, was obviously not going to make us any friends. Um, and these timescales were immutable. I mean, they, they shouldn't have been, uh, but of course they were attached to the release of a television program, which meant that they had to be uh, delivered by that point in time. Um, things like the player project were... Um, board mandated um, projects these are things that have been promised to shareholders um, as a solution for uh, 
a solution for the the income during a, a financial crisis problem uh, and so this was a very politically charged project and it had to happen uh, ultimately it was a, a, a lot late and a lot over budget and a lot of the people involved don't have jobs anymore but that's the that's the way these things play out many of the developers like i would say actually almost all developers uh, fewer of the operations team uh, were contract staff um, and so you can't fail to lose tribal knowledge at the end of a project when everyone goes, I've had enough of this, I'm not supporting it, I'm going somewhere else, uh, and rolls off. And not all the developers were full stack competent. So back in sort of 2011, when we were deploying Vagrant for the first time, uh, Vagrant on Windows was was a real struggle, and it involved lots of horrifying stuff like JRuby and having to understand how gems worked and configuring putty for for. Uh, key-based SSH access, lots of legwork. That's all solved now. The Vagrant project comes with installers where that's all dealt with. Uh, but back in these times, um, we were having to, to do a lot of that sort of manual support. Uh, and people who, who write CSS for a living don't necessarily see why they should have to install a Ruby interpreter on their box, which I think is probably fair. Uh, and the team expanded rapidly. And I, I don't think um, I've worked anywhere that's had a, a, a rapid team expansion that's also managed to hit deadlines immediately as a result of that. Um, I'm sure we've all read Mythical Man Month. If you haven't, go and get a copy. It's as relevant now as it was 40 years ago. Um, you can't just keep adding people to the team. There's, a, there's an overhead of communication. Um, and, uh, and that's going to set you back, at least initially. So the consequences of, the, of these sort of um, challenges that we faced really was that the, the automated testing side of things was pretty much ignored. I mean, we'd, we'd, uh, we were supporting the running of tests in the delivery pipeline, but, um, but weren't actually writing any ourselves. Uh, the teams that were building the software were not writing tests for it. Um, and, uh, and so the deliverables were, were not especially high quality. Um, this, combined with the, uh, with the timescale issues, led to quite a lot of blame storming, quite a lot of finger pointing, um, and, and a lot of that was, was just because we, we didn't have that kind of shared ownership. We were, we were all working for, uh, for different parts of the organization with different uh, agendas, different timescales, um, and at the end of the day, quality versus uh, deliverable, deliverable speed, um, there's always going to be a trade-off in one or the other. We had a fairly high staff turnover, so uh, a lot of people who were working on, on these projects kind of rolled off their contracts, either because they were uh, not deemed good enough or were themselves sick of, of doing the work. Uh, and so we brought some more experts in, um, and, uh, and the experts that we brought in brought more uh, challenges to the table. Um, specifically, this was a, a resulted in a, in a redevelopment of, uh, of part of the platform at quite a late stage to solve performance problems that we hadn't proven existed, uh, and that was a problem. Uh, and so ultimately, the, 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 platform, uh, the platforms limp over the, the finish line and, and get out there, um, but they take a lot of operation. They're not always up. They're quite slow. Um, there, are, there are some issues to be solved. Um, they, they haven't solved some of the issues that were uh, problems with the .NET platform, um, as a result of some of the, the re-architecture that went on. Uh, and ultimately, ac across the whole organization, the, the, um, the confidence in Drupal just sort of dropped right off. And it, it was deemed then not to be a, a suitable platform for new development. Uh, a whole new team of people came in, mostly from uh, the BBC. Uh, and now they're, they're rebuilding um, these sorts of things from scratch in a combination of Java and PHP. Uh, yes, and that's, let's not talk about that. <laughs> um, so let's have a look at, at, at what we uh, what we did there as, as an organization. How, how did we help uh, ITV? Well, let's go back to the four pillars. Um, we put automation in, right? The, we, we put uh, Puppet and Jenkins in place um, to, uh, to, to reduce the amount of manual tasks, to, to improve the efficiency of, of some of the work that was going on. Uh, we added monitoring. Zabbix went in. We also put Graylog in. The the sort of availability of data to, to the teams was uh, was much increased as a result of the work that we did. Um, we uh, we encouraged sharing by providing um, shareable development environments and making the, uh, the the logging and monitoring data available to um, to all the teams. Um, but ultimately, when we come back to this list, there's a there's a sort of fundamental missing point here, and that's culture. Um, and we kind of didn't do anything with that. And I think um, that's the main sort of learning point from all this, really, is that uh, the success, we're technologists. We're at a technology conference. 
Um, you and I are, are probably all happiest um, sat at a terminal um, bashing commands into a, a black window with a prompt on it, um, or at the very least cutting code or uh, you know, running scripts or what have you. Um, but success <coughs> in anything like this is, is really about more than just the technology. Um, and a cultural factor um, will make or break any project. It doesn't matter how good the technology is, you can bring the, the cutting edge fully working to the table, um, but if the cultural factors aren't there, it's not going to work. And that's, that's really the bottom line. Um, and if you have culture that, that sort of suggests that failure isn't an option and, you know, if, if you make a, make a mistake, you're going to be fired or we must hit deadlines or cost or, you know, testing can wait, doesn't matter, we'll do that later. Um, let's just work everybody a bit harder. They're all contractors, right? We're, we're paying them a lot of money. All those sorts of these cultural aspects will always undermine any technical quality that's, that's going on. Uh, but cultural change is hard, right? You're dealing with people. We're not dealing with uh, pieces of software. Um, if I could upload a new firmware into, uh, into an operations engineer and, uh, and put them in a new task, I would absolutely do that. It's not possible. You can't do it. Um, and cultural change, kind of, it comes from the top, right? It, it comes downwards. If your manager doesn't have the cultural values that you have, it's very difficult to, to get them recognized within your organization. Um, and so in, in a company of 4,000 people, you can imagine how deep that stack is before you start talking to, to people who, who have uh, the same culture as you. It's, it's a long way down. Like the p people who are sat at the board table, shareholders, they, they have no idea what automation is or, or what continuous delivery is or why that would be important. And you can sell them on it, but it takes time. Uh, and it's, again, not as easy as putting a new firmware in your board, although give it a try. Maybe it'll work for you. Um, and ch cultural change under pressure. I mean, it, change it's in itself is, is hard. Cultural change is hard. Change under pressure is really difficult. And cultural change under pressure is just a combination of nightmares. And there's a, a, a book written by Tom DeMarco, uh, which some of you may have read, called Slack, uh, which is about making time um, in your organization for, uh, for basically Slack activities. And, and he says, um, paraphrase, Slack is the lubricant of change. Bad companies can only obsess about removing it. And it's entirely true. I think if you're obsessed with deadlines um, and you're working everybody to, to the quick of their fingers, um, you're not going to get cultural change out of them. You're not going to get risk-taking out of them. No, one, no one's going to do new, exciting things in that kind of environment. Um, all of this kind of stuff takes time. And, and as, as managers within a, a large organization, we have to, to find a way of, of providing that time to our people so that they can excel. Otherwise, um, you end up with um, a bad taste in your mouth. That's me. Um, uh, I will take any questions either about the, uh, the technologies that we used or maybe some of the specifics about the organization, but maybe not in too much detail. <laughs> Any questions? Can I ask um, how often uh, they are spinning up branches of their code now um, as a, an organization in this kind of environment? So, um, so I mentioned that the .NET platform was, was going out on a sort of uh, six weekly basis. Um, in parallel with the work we were doing in the, in the Linux world, um, we also had guys from ThoughtWorks um, doing uh, a lot of legwork on, on bringing that kind of uh, automation into the .NET world. Um, and the, the releases were, were still not frequent by kind of IMVU standards, um, but they were uh, arguably weekly, possibly fortnightly, but, but much less broken. Uh, and, and there was much higher confidence in being able to release those things during the day. Uh, rather than having to drag engineers in overnight. I mean, there were some architectural things that that, that essentially were, were not going to be fixed because the decision had already been made to back the Drupal horse, um, which meant that not many of those changes went on. Um, in the uh, in the Linux world, we were able to release multiple times a day, um, but because there was only limited automated testing, um, we would only release those sorts of changes, um, you know, cautiously. Shall we say? But on average, they're they're doing multi 
multiple times a day they're doing releases now. Yeah, I mean, they, they certainly were at the um, the point at which uh, all this stuff started getting released. The spin-ups are under an hour or something like that? Yeah, yeah, much, much less than that. Um, okay. I mean, the, the, the deployment of a, of a Drupal site, if you're doing it, if you're automating it and doing it right, there's no reason why it should take more than a couple of minutes. You're just copying files around, right? Okay. Depends on your database migrations, but... And one last thing there, DevOps team, you said there were 14 to begin with. What's that scaled down to now for the Linux part? Um, so the right now there are, I believe, two or three members of, of kind of um, third line Linux uh, engineers. Um, but the the front line staff, there are still that many people there because they, they've expanded the, the business hours coverage for a start. Um, and also that team have taken on Linux responsibilities. But it's troubleshooting and, and escalation as opposed to kind of full on deep Linux knowledge. So the 14, 14 was for the entire operations team. Um, and they, the existing operations team took on more Linux responsibilities. They weren't sort of chopped and changed for, for Linux people, although some hiring went on to, to add some more Linux uh, capability into that team. But ultimately, my feeling is that if you're, if you're doing uh, DevOps in the right way, um, hiring low-end uh, Linux operators doesn't really help because most of, the, most of the troubleshooting you're going to do is complicated, and so all you're doing there is adding a new set of people to triage through. Yeah. Hello. Uh, you said that there's a monitoring system that you used in 2011, mm -hmm. and is there any change three, uh, two or three years after that? Is there better systems for this now? Okay, so the question is, am I still using Zabbix? <laughs> um, okay. And, it, and the, the answer is yes, but we do still use Zabbix. Um, we, um, we find it, uh, it suffices for the most part. Like mo most customers that we, that we work with um, are of a certain size, right? And, and Zabbix is more than capable of doing that. We also have an, a, set, uh, a set of libraries and patterns that we can reuse for deploying that sort of monitoring. Um, so deploying Zabbix for us takes an afternoon, whereas doing something else would involve starting from scratch. Um, the, the other monitoring systems, or the, or the sort of the newer technologies that are around now, things that are based on Graphite and uh, CollectD and, and all the other kind of exciting things in that world, uh, which if you were at Monitorama uh, recently, you probably heard a lot about. Um, for me, they're not a fully formed solution yet, and, and we make our, our kind of living taking solutions to people, um, and so we already have a, a, a formed solution at the point at which uh, we find that there's a good way of plugging all those new, shiny, exciting components together in a way that means that we can deliver them quickly and reliably, then we'll be doing that as well. So just a quick reminder, I'll be doing a talk about monitoring in the infrastructure as code age, about specifically those tools tomorrow. Cool. Go and see Chris's talk about monitoring. He's a big fan of monitoring, and that's okay. Um, Chris is also running, if, if you're um, interested in, in DevOps in general and you're here today, which of course you are, because I'm talking to you in this room, um, Chris is running a, a DevOps meetup. Is it, no, someone is running a DevOps. Okay, there's a, there's a gentleman over there in a, in a wine-colored T-shirt who is running a DevOps meetup in, uh, in Prague this evening. Uh, go and talk to him, because apparently neither I nor Chris know anything about it. <laughs> Cool. Hi John. Paul, um, hey. You mentioned testing. Uh, yes. What kind of testing were they doing? What was automated? Any kind of TV, BDD type stuff? Yeah, so the, the, um, the components that we, we were essentially spiking were around capybara um, and uh, cucumber size of things. And um, that ultimately may not have been the right tool chain, uh, partly because the, um, the, the technology... Um, dependencies for making that work um, certainly on on the Red Hat 5 environment we were working on is actually quite arduous we had to rebuild all of like QT windowing environments and, and all sorts of new things um, plus the the um, the testing tooling was then all Ruby and given that we were hiring PHP developers for the most part that didn't really sit properly um, there were there was an existing automated test function within the organization who were doing kind of uh, gherkin style testing uh, on the Windows platform. We assumed that, that we'd be able to sort of make use of the same sorts of tooling, uh, but ultimately it didn't really happen. It wasn't adopted by the dev teams. We probably could have helped more, um, but uh, that was largely where we were at. Um, I 
right now, I couldn't say how I'd do it differently. Um, I guess the, there's some sort of uh, selenium-based things that might be worth looking at in this. And what, sorry? BCAT. Uh, it's an area I'm not especially familiar with. It's all a bit kind of programmy for me. I'm a bit further down the stack these days. Um, but yeah, it's, it's difficult to know how, how we do it better. Uh, so it's certainly an area of, um, of that I should probably read a bit more about because I think there are, that's probably moved on quite a lot more in three years than, than much of the other stuff. So sort of following on from that, there's a BIHAT lab uh, tomorrow about five o'clock, I think. Um, but my question was about, it uh, follows on from that, about uh, do you do performance testing as part of your uh, deployment as well as functional testing? Yeah, so we did, um, so the non-functional stuff was um, the, the tests that we, that we put together for that were not part of the deployment pipeline. Um, so... Um, we engaged with a, a, a third party called Soester, who have a, a product called Cloud Test, which allows you to to build um, test uh, kind of test building blocks and plug them together. It's a little bit like editing video. There's a sort of timeline, and you go, I want four of these and ten of these, and and you can put sort of um, random based decision points in there and that kind. Of, it's a really good tool. Um, pretty expensive, um, but uh, but it, it also for us, saved a, a lot of a lot of time and grief because it has a when you run the tests, it can plug into agents running behind your firewall and report back what the the actual result of that is. So you get to see a dashboard of what are the tests doing, what are my what are the errors look like, what are, what are the actual error codes coming back, um, what what's the database doing, you know, and actually pulling out MySQL statistics and, and that sort of thing. So they're definitely worth uh, worth checking out, um, but. Because of the um, because of what what was involved, something that we do sort of pre-release or pre pre-large release. Uh, beyond that, the non-functional characteristics we we measured um, page response times using well, a combination of pingdom, but also from the uh, from the the logs on the the, to the traffic directors on the front end, and put that through Zabbix so we could see how the how the the page performance changed in trend after a release. Um, I know Soester are, are pushing um, kind of integration hooks for their tool. So in theory, you can integrate it with Jenkins and do it as part of a, of a performance regression test. Uh, but the, the price tag was sort of five or six figures, which was uh, something that we tried to get in there. But ultimately, it was a difficult conversation to have when there were other things to spend money on. Great. All right. Thanks Any other time. questions? Right then, give it up for John. Thanks very much. <laughs>